is titled Across the Universe with Black Hole Collisions. And our presenter today is Dr. Manuela Campanelli, a professor of mathematical sciences and astrophysical sciences and technology, as well as the founding director of the Center for Computational Relativity and Gravitation here at RIT. Manuela is also a member of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, which on September 14, 2015, made the most important physics discovery of the last half century on the first observation of gravitational waves from the collision of two black holes. Dr. Campanelli has extensive research experience on Einstein's theory of general relativity, astrophysics of black holes, and gravitational waves. She was a lead author on one of three landmark papers in the field of numerical general relativity chosen by the American Physical Society to celebrate 100 years of Einstein's general relativity. The others were from Princeton University and NASA Goddard Space Center. In her 2005 paper, Campanelli and her co-authors solved the Einstein's equations for colliding black holes for the first time. LIGO's observations of gravitational waves on September 14, 2015 perfectly matched mathematical models of colliding black holes. Manuela has published numerous papers on groundbreaking numerical simulations of binary black holes, space times, exploring physical effects such as superkicks and spin-driven orbital dynamics. In 2007, she discovered that supermass black holes can be ejected from most galaxies at speeds of up to 4,000 kilometers per second. Her more current research focuses on computer simulations of merging supermass black holes and on magnetohydrodynamics simulations of their accretion disk and jet dynamics in connection with both gravitational wave and electromagnetic observations. She discovered a number of relativistic effects that completely overturned the earlier understanding of these systems and have the potential to create distinctive radiation features that may uniquely mark supermassive binary black holes in the relativistic regime. Manuela was the recipient of several awards and recognitions, including the Marie Curie Fellowship, the American Physical Society Fellowship, and the RIT Trustee Award in 2014. She was also the chair of the American Physical Society Topical Group in Gravitation in 2013. Manuela, we are very lucky to have you today. Take it away. Thank you, Cynthia. Do you hear me? I hope uh, uh, you hear me well. So, so, so far, uh, the information that comes to us from the universe is from light. Uh, since the invention of the telescope on uh, 1600 by Galileo Galilei, we have uh, since then discovered that there are hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe, as well as uh, hundreds of billions of, of stars in each of these galaxies. So uh, uh, this is an image that you see on the background of the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope, um, where you see very distant galaxies. So light uh, comes to us in many forms. Uh, it, uh, it has a spectrum that ranges from visible, infrared, radio, x-ray, and so on, and has brought us a lot of information um, from the universe, from um, practically uh, thousands of years, um, uh, hundreds of thousands of years after the uh, Big Bang, um, to uh, actually the light that comes to us uh, from the near stars, including our sun, of course, and uh, the recent discoveries of exoplanets. We know from uh, the information uh, that light has brought to us uh, is that the universe is 13.8 billion years old, and that 5% uh, of all the um, matter uh, visible, there is only 5% of the all visible matters in the universe, and the rest is practically dark. The rest is distributed into dark matter and dark energy, as you can see in the percentage uh, that you can read from the screen. So only 5% of the visible matter uh, in the universe. Uh, so there is a lot of dark objects um, that are present in the universe. Now, among those dark objects um, are uh, black holes. Now, imagine that um, we can hear black holes for the first time. Um, and in order to do that, because black holes are region, are pure regions of space, uh, very strong uh, spaces, is very uh, uh, 
compact, compact and where gravity is so intense that uh, all matter and light uh, cannot escape it. Now, imagine that you can hear uh, black holes, especially binary black holes, two black holes colliding. And that is uh, what we're going to hear in the next uh, slide, the uh, actual detection that the LIGO scientific collaboration did in uh, September uh, 14, 2015. You're going to hear the collision uh, of two black holes through the actual ripples of the space and time that these collisions are, have made. You're going to hear it because the um, ripples are actually waves, and those waves are, happen to be in the frequency range that a human ear can hear. So let me play this uh, video. LIGO heard uh, about now more than a year ago. And what you heard the first was uh, the sound that the detectors uh, collect, typically noise. And at the end, you heard like a chirp, bloop, bloop. That was actually the merger of two black holes. These two black holes merge in a very distant universe about 1.3 billion years light away, light years away from us. Now, uh, what you're going to see is actually a reproduction, a simulation, an actual numerical simulation that uh, reproduces exactly what happened in that distance universe when LIGO detected the waves. So what you're seeing here is two black holes colliding, and as they collide, they do produce this, they actually cause the space and time to ripple into itself. They, these ripples propagate upward to Earth. And when the black holes do merge together, they do collide and they form one black hole, you see there is a huge burst at the end of these ripples and gravitational waves, which are ripple space-time. And uh, imagine that in this very last moment in the collision of these two black holes, the energy that went into these gravitational waves is comparable, uh, actually greater, um, and a thousand times greater than um, the whole energy uh, that uh, is contained in the uh, luminosity of the visible stars in the universe. So it's really a huge amount of energy that is emitted in just a fraction, fractions of seconds. So this is what LIGO discovered. And it did confirm an important, um, the, most important theory we have about gravity, which is the theory of Einstein general activity, which he formulated in 1915. Now, what Einstein did, he revolutionized completely our understanding of gravity because, as you can see in the figure uh, in this slide, well, what happens is that um, gravity is actually caused by the distortion um, of the space uh, and time caused by masses. And so it's no longer a force actually that attract uh, objects uh, among each other, like Newton had formulated, but it is rather this distortion, this um, distortion of the cur uh, or curvature of the space and time. Uh, now, gravitational waves happen to be actually ripples in the fabric of the space and time, pretty much as you see in this image that you uh, have on the screen. Um, Gravitational waves, therefore, are totally different from light. They are totally, completely different spectrum, and they travel, at the, also they travel at the same speed of light, of course, and they, but they bring a total, completely different information uh, from, uh, than light from the universe. They can bring information about hidden things, like, for example, uh, dark objects, like, for example, black holes or binary black holes. Now, what else can make gravitational waves? We've seen that gra gravitational waves can be made by two colliding black holes, but in order to, uh, to create gravitational waves, you will need uh, a lot of mass, okay, and very rapid acceleration. That's exactly what you have with two black holes. There are other objects that uh, can also do, um, produce similar um, accelerating, um, a similar rapid acceleration. And we're talking here about accelerations of nearly to the 
uh, that cause the object to move nearly the speed of light. Okay, so the black holes that you saw, for example, in the video I showed before, um, it, they were moving at a, at a speed that was slowed down for the purpose of the visualization, but you wouldn't be able to catch it uh, with your here, uh, with your um, um, height, sorry, um, because they um, because they would be moving really uh, at nearly half of the speed of light. So really, objects are moving very rapidly, a lot of mass, concentrated masses. They cause gravitational waves that are detectable here on Earth. So other objects that cause this are, um, for example, collisions of neutron stars or uh, explosions of very massive stars, uh, which we call supernova, uh, for example, and the Big Bang itself. Now, what do they produce when they come to Earth? What is the effect of gravitational waves? So you are seeing here a visualization that is being, of course, vastly exaggerated for the purpose of illustration, but uh, when uh, these waves reach Earth, they will actually uh, cause uh, the space uh, uh, um, to stretch and compress, to stretch and compress repeatedly. Let me see if I can replay this video to show you what happens. But, okay, so what happens is that LIGO, therefore, uh, has been constructed to detect precisely this continuous stretching and compression. And so here you see the images of uh, the two LIGO detectors uh, that are constructed in this characteristic L shape that um, precisely is designed to detect this uh, stretching and compression of the space time. There are two of such detectors. One is in uh, Livingston in the state of Louisiana, and the other one is in Humford in the state of Washington. The third detector that you see uh, in the smaller picture is the detector that is in Italy, in Pisa, which uh, is an additional detector to LIGO, which is, uh, which is participating in together with a partnership, and just uh, came online just in the next, in the, in the very, very, uh, this, this week or last week. So uh, what was the community of the scientists working around this um, detectors is uh, made of roughly a thousands of scientists and distributed across uh, 15 countries. It's a huge collaboration. But how LIGO work? And I will show you that, this in the next video. So you have uh, test masses at the end of each um, masses, massive objects, uh, at the end of each of the L arms and, and the photodetectors here at the center. And then laser are shown up from um, the center to the actual mirrors or masses at the end of the L shape. And if there is no gravitational waves, the actual waves, uh, uh, wavelength of the laser is perfectly in phase and there is no um, photon that is detected in the photodetectors. But if, if a gravitational wave passes by, as you can see now, uh, then uh, these wavelength goes out of phase and the photodetector will detect photons and that's how we reveal gravitational waves. Now, the effect again that you see in this video is being extremely exaggerated uh, for the purpose of illustration. Because in reality, the effect that LIGO has to detect is extremely small. Now we are going down here to the actual uh, size um, or change in size that LIGO has to detect, which is actually smaller, it's one ten thousand more than the width of a proton, okay? So we are going down, this is the hydrogen, uh, the video show the hydrogen atom, and we're going down to uh, basically the change that LIGO has to measure, which is one ten thousand the width of a proton. So it's incredible. So that measurement, um, if you would like to put it in another perspective, imagine now uh, our nearest star, Okay, Proxima Centauri, which is 4.3 like years away. And imagine that um, the measurement that LIGO has to do is to the precision of 10 microns. Microns, which is a 10 microns, is actually the weight of a human hair. 
So this is the type of precision the LIGO has to measure uh, um, in order to detect rotational waves. Uh, this is amazing. So therefore, one can say that LIGO is the most um, is the most precise um, uh, measurement um, ex experiment that, that we have ever done. Okay. Now I want to switch um, to another topic, which is related, of course, and it's related more to my own uh, research, and it has to do with how we did produce the video that you show uh, that I showed at the beginning of my talk, and it has to do with uh, actually putting the black holes that LIGO detected into a virtual environment of a supercomputer and model them so accurately that the signal that LIGO detected. Um, uh, that matches our signal and vice versa. So uh, in order to do that, you have to solve the Einstein's equations. These equations are very complex. Um, they are actually uh, involve hundreds of terms and when you try, and so you have to uh, solve them numerically using uh, supercomputers. You cannot do that in just pencil and paper. And when you write down the computer codes um, to numerically solve these equations, they involve thousands of terms. So it's really a huge daunting task to do it. It took more than 50 years for the entire community to actually be able to solve these equations. But in 2005, three groups were successful, including my own group, um, to uh, model, to basically solve this problem. Uh, and to uh, then produce um, successful models uh, for uh, black hole collisions. Now, these supercomputers, this is a, one of the supercomputers that we have here uh, at the Center for Computational Relativity and Gravitation, uh, requires uh, a lot of um, memory and uh, a lot of uh, also processor speed and as well interconnect. Now, what you see here in the next video is in the next, this image is actually the uh, wave, uh, the waveform, uh, the gravitational waves that LIGO detected. So, in the first row, you see the actual data uh, that LIGO detected. Those were the data that you also heard in the videos at the beginning, the sound of the church. Um, and you see that the data um, from the two detectors, so you bought the uh, blue and uh, yellow lines, they actually superpose perfectly, which means that the two detectors independently detected the same signal. And that's important to confirm that this is a real detection and, and, and it happened independently and it's not just random now. Um, the second rule is actually the model produced with the numerical relativity simulation. And you see how beautifully the simulations match the signal that LIGO detected. This was amazing from my own perspective because, um, well, because we proceeded with two different, of course, um, um, uh, routes. So there were scientists uh, working on this very challenging, extremely challenging experiment that had to do this incredible measurement. And then there was a, a group of scientists working on the modeling that had to do this very challenging uh, calculation. And both we came together and produced this um, uh, perfect matching. So what's happening now is that we are producing many more of these uh, gravitational wave signals. Those are all calculated uh, now by solving the Einstein's equation in supercomputers. And what you see here is that they all have different shapes, different lengths, and so on. And that's because the gravitational wave signal do change um, when uh, you change, for example, the masses of the black hole, or if you uh, changes uh, how the black holes uh, rotate around itself. So therefore, what we are doing is build a um, database of all possible black hole collisions that LIGO could detect. So we can use this and match it to the data. Now, the type of black holes that LIGO detected are uh, what we call stellar mass black holes. 
They come usually from dying stars that are about 10 to 50 times more massive than our sun. There are also other types of black holes in the universe, those that are located in the center of galaxies, which we call supermassive black holes that are range from millions to billions um, of times the mass of our own sun. For example, there is the black hole at the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, Sagittarius A, which is four million times more mass than our sun. So we would like also to know whether these black holes collide, and we do know that galaxies um, have collided, and so if they do collide, their central black hole should also collide. And by understanding um, how these collisions happen, we learn a lot in the process of how uh, galaxies have formed and how build up. So in order to do that, we would, we would, would like to send in space a new detector. This is uh, called LISA. This is a collaboration between ESA and NASA. And um, it, hopefully that is a mission that will uh, go up in uh, about between 15 to 20 years from now. And it will be detecting uh, gravitational waves that are coming from the collisions of supermassive black holes. In the future, we are going to have, therefore, an array of various detectors. We are going to have um, a variety of gravitational wave detectors that are going to bring us the news uh, from the very distant universe that uh, you couldn't uh, see with regular telescopes. But we are also going to have many, of course, of the astronomical telescopes that are coming online that are more and more sensitive. and so. We are hoping to combine this information um, together to gain a lot more understanding of the universe, and we call this multi-messenger astronomy. It's a new type of astronomy because now you not only have light as a messenger, but you also have gravitational waves. So we have just, therefore, we say that we have just opened a new window into the universe through the gravitational waves. And of course, by opening a new window into the universe, uh, we might actually uh, have surprises. And so just stay tuned. Um, you will probably hear more soon uh, about new discoveries from uh, um, the gravitational wave detectors. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm open now for questions. All righty. Well, Kenneth has a question. His question is specific to um, you could back up a slide. Um, his question is, with the two LIGO facilities, can you determine the location of the black hole merger? Okay, that's a very good question. We know it comes from the southern hemisphere, but with only two detectors, we cannot really locate it uh, very precisely. So we, we do know it's a, it's a small region in the south, southern hemisphere where it's coming from. Um, but we will need to have more than one detector in order to narrow down the precise location. We do know the distance very well and very precisely. It's, as I say, 1.3 1, 1. Um, billion light years away. And it's coming from the southern hemisphere. I, I don't have here an image of that, but um, we can narrow it down a, a little bit more uh, than just, just the entire <laughs> southern hemisphere, but uh, it needs, uh, it's, it's not so precisely, uh, you know, not at the level where we need in order to use, for example, astronomical telescope and pinpoint astronomical telescope and see if there is also photons associated. Not yet. But with uh, additional detectors, uh, like, for example, Virgo, we can already improve coming online. Virgo is the Italian, uh, Italian detector coming online. We can improve um, much better the localization. And in the future, we're also hoping to um, get uh, a Japanese detector uh, coming online uh, planned around 2018. And that's going to further narrow down the our ability to uh, localize uh, the source. And another detector in India just started, uh, was just start construction soon. Thank you. Can you also determine the mass of the two black holes? Yes. 
Actually, this is one of the nice things that we can do with the modeling that I showed you. Um, the modeling uh, of the actual model of the waveforms is what uh, allows us to extract the masses of the black hole. The um, black hole that you heard in the uh, presentation um, were about 30 uh, solar mass each. And we can determine not only, of course, um, the uh, masses of the individual object and merges, but also the final merger uh, of black holes. And we can do that thanks to the modeling. Okay. Um, why is it that the gravitational waves travel at the same speed of light waves? Oh, this is actually a prediction of the theory of general relativity. Um, so, uh, it, and it is an important, actually, prediction, and the fact that uh, LIGO detected uh, gravitational waves traveling at the speed of light is precisely confirming uh, this other important prediction. So clearly, this was a very large discovery and confirmation of the theory. So, what does it mean in the grander scheme of things for those of us who are not in the astrophysics world? <laughs> okay. So. Um, so I will give you um, a, a two types of answers here. Uh, the answer that um, I like to give um, in more general sense is that we have uh, just opened a new window into the universe because now we can not only get information from light but also from gravitational waves. So we, we have to rewrite now completely our textbook in astronomy and science because um, we, we have a totally new way to do astronomy. Uh, so you can compare this like uh, when Galileo Galilei in the 1600s for the first time invented a telescope. Now, of course with a telescope he could see the planets and so on, but he couldn't see the galaxy, he couldn't see everything. Imagine what would come next. And we're just at the beginning, so you can compare this um, to, to, to that kind of revolution. So it's a total revolution of our understanding of the universe and the ability to perceive the universe um, in, with a different type of messenger than just light. Now, the other answer I'm going to give you is that, of course, there is a, um, the people that like to have, uh, for example, more pragmatic answer. Okay, there is a lot of technology developments that are associated uh, with this type of um, experiments, like LIGO, for example, but even with the numerical activity simulations and the codes that we have to write, because they're extremely challenging. Now, imagine, imagine the measurement that LIGO had to do. Um, if you remember, I say that LIGO had to measure something that was uh, a thousand smaller than the width of, uh, of, of a proton. That's amazing. The technology to measure that, the stability of the lasers, um, or the suspension mechanism, that pretty, pretty much like the suspension that you have in your own cars, but they are a little bit more sophisticated. Um, the analysis, the data analysis tools, the statistics um, um, methods that you have to devise in order, for example, to extract the noise from the data, all of that. It has applications in many, many domains. Okay, thank you. Doug has a question going back to um, the visible light waves. His question is, you mentioned that the ripples are very different from visible light rays. Is it only coincidental that the collision produces a wave within our range of hearing? Uh, that is a very good question. So the range of hearing, um, um, it's because the frequency of the waves that LIGO detected happen to be in that, in that range, but it's related to the actual masses of the object. So the more massive are the objects, the more, uh, the, the, the more, or the lower is the, the wavelength, okay, longer period. So the ones that LIGO can hear are produced for um, black holes that are typically 30 solar mass, 10 solar masses. Um, those have, um, there are, co uh, there are in, in that range frequency. But um, other black holes, like the supermassive black holes, have a much longer wavelength. So they, for example, LIGO cannot detect those. We have to go into space. 
So it depends on the masses of the black holes. So the more massive are the objects, like the, you know, the ones at the center of the, of the galaxies, then those uh, we do require, again, another type of detectors. Okay. There's another question, I think, more related to the technology. What is the length of the two, quote unquote, wings of the LIGO detectors? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, I didn't mention that in my talk. Uh, so uh, they are four kilometers uh, apart, uh, each of the length of the arms of the two detectors. Uh, the Virgo detector is three kilometers. Now, uh, that particular choice has been uh, done, um, is it, was it considered a good trade-off in terms of cost to build a detector um, and, you know, also in terms of our ability to do the measurement. Um, and so you could have perhaps longer arms, but then if you do with, uh, if you make longer arms, for example, you can um, improve uh, the sensitivity of the detector. But then what you happen, you have also to consider that the earth is not flat. <laughs> so if you make the arm longer, and we we have to correct for that. Uh -huh. So so that was the reason why we we chose that particular length. Ah, makes sense. Um, following this discovery, where is your research headed now, and what what is your team working on? So we are working on a number of different fronts. Um, as you saw in one of my slides, um, uh, where uh, we had all these waveforms, number of waveforms that were all different shapes, um, and that's uh, because we we're doing many simulations for um, you know these black holes having different masses, different uh, rotation speeds around each other, and so on. And we we are working very actively to help LIGO to construct this database. That's one uh, area we're working on. The other area has to do with modeling other type of sources. We also would like to detect uh, uh, gravitational waves from the merger of two neutron stars, uh, stars that are basically made only on nuclear matter. Um, and um, those uh, require that we not only solve the equation of Einstein in vacuum, it's not just pure space and time, it, we also require equations of that govern the ma matter, uh, how matter evolves. That's why we say uh, hydrodynamics. And then, uh, the, of course, is magnetized magnetohydrodynamics. Uh, so we need to combine all these equations together. They're very complex. So we're working in um, um, performing, trying to perform this simulation in a way that they are um, uh, amenable in uh, the use of supercomputers. And we're also, um, another type of work that we're doing is that we're looking in the situation where there may be gas surrounding uh, the black holes, and that's actually a very realistic scenario for the case of the supermassive black holes, those that are the centers in the galaxy. In that case, you might expect that you may have an accretion disk, and when the black holes collide, therefore, they will produce uh, shocks. They will heat the gas. So not only, therefore, you will get the gravitational waves from the um, colliding black holes um, in that case, um, but you also get uh, high energetic photons. And the idea here is to combine these two uh, um, information, the information that you get from the Patterns and the information you get from the gravitational waves to learn more about this type of uh, event. So can we expect some major future announcements from your work and your team? <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, just uh, um, stay, stay tuned. Um, and you can imagine LIGO is taking data. Uh, you can imagine that the, the expectation is that um, you know, we might detect once LIGO the, the, the reaches the full design sensitivity one event per day. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, you will hear more about it. Um, you have to be patient because we go through a lot of analysis and a lot of checks and checks before we, um, we publish mm -hmm. papers. But um, you will certainly hear a lot about that. Great. So you're putting RIT on the map. That's fantastic. Um, if there are any questions additional, please get them into the chat box as quickly as possible so that we can get your answers. 
Um, I don't see any yes. Anything coming in? Nothing? Going once? <laughs> Anyone? Oh, I got it. We got it. Thank you, Doctor. That would be you, oh, thank you. Dr. Campanelli. All right, well, if there, if there are any other questions, then you can certainly submit them and you can email them to ritalum at rit.edu or you can tweet them to at rit underscore alumni with the hashtag me rit webinars. And we will actually get your questions to Dr. Campanelli and get you some answers back. Kenneth says, thank you. Rudy says, just say congratulations to the team. You guys rock. Bruce says, thank you. So thank you to uh, all of you for joining us today. Thanks to Dr. Campanelli for her presentation. Stay tuned, as, she, as she's pointed out, more announcements are forthcoming. Um, you can join us in about two weeks for uh, an introduction to RIT's 10th president, our incoming president, Dr. David Munson will be on hand to do a one-hour webinar with all of you and all of your fellow alumni. So look for that invitation coming out in the next few days. Thanks again for joining us. Again, please send any additional questions to us via email. And you can exit this webinar by closing the WebEx window. And feel free to take the optional survey about what you thought of today's webinar that pops up when you exit. Otherwise, thanks so much again and have a great day. Thank you, everyone.